Oxygen Blast Technical Seminars are an Intertech production. For instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. Okay, well, first off, folks, let's go ahead and talk a bit about what is RESTful Web Services, uh, and in particular talk about some of the fundamentals of RESTful Web Services, and we'll look at taking a comparison uh, of RESTful Web Services to SOAP-based Web Services, which even if you're not familiar with SOAP-based Web Services, try and at least give you some indication of why RESTful Web Services even exist, and compare and contrast that to some of the technologies, even if you haven't used, you might have heard of in the SOAP environment. So when we talk about web services, let's first define what we mean by web services. Um, web services is all about um, a software system designed to uh, support interoperable machine-to-machine -machine communication. Uh, when I'm teaching class to folks about web services, be it SOAP or RESTful web services, I often talk about how uh, web services are, are not, even though we've got that term web in the name, are not about human interaction. When we often think of the World Wide Web, we think about how we as humans uh, communicate with and interact with things out there on the World Wide Web. Well, web services are about machine-to-machine -machine facilitation. How do we get two machines to uh, talk to one another? And there are many different ways to do that that's been happening Oh, since the dawn and creation of software engineering and uh, software systems. Um, but when we're talking about web services, we're talking about interoperable machine-to-machine -machine interaction. In other words, how do we get a .NET platform to talk to a Java platform? Or how do we get a mainframe platform to talk to, uh, say, a Java platform? Things of that nature. And that's not always as uh, easy as one might think, especially given all the uh, characteristics of all the platforms out there. Even things like character sets aren't exactly the same on most platforms out there. So how do we facilitate that? Well, a lot of technologies have come up to help address that issue. And of course, uh, many of us are probably familiar with SOAP-based web services. Well, SOAP-based web services, at least uh, most people find, are a bit complex and tend to lead a little bit to what we call exchange bloat. And from a Java perspective, when you say, well, Jim, how are they uh, complex? Well, I have flashed up there on the screen the alphabet soup, which is all of the APIs and technologies, which one typically has to know and understand before building SOAP-based web services in Java. And when you look at that list, that's a pretty extensive list. That's a pretty steep learning curve. Some of the technologies, something like XML, may not be that bad. Uh, but even a simple, something as simple as XML namespaces starts to usually confuse people pretty quickly. And on top of that, all the technologies to, um, if you will, parse and uh, discern what exactly is in a SOAP message, well, that, uh, that takes some doing. In fact, if you take a look here on the screen, as I've provided, uh, this is a little tiny example of just how bloated, in some cases, uh, SOAP messages can be. For example, on the screen here on our left, we have an example of a SOAP message uh, requesting what the stock price is for, say, the Target company's stock, so TGT stock. And down here on the right-hand side, we see a response that the price, at least as of this moment, is $50.00. 64 cents. All of that text that you see on the screen to communicate essentially those less than 10 characters to one another. So, yep, that is the interoperable exchange of information facilitating that machine to machine communication. But that's where we start to get into this idea of exchange bloat and the complexity of all those APIs to put these simple messages together. So SOAP works, XML, uh, SOAP-based messages have provided web services for many, many years and will continue to do so, but at some cost, at least as far as many people are concerned. Now, that's to say, too, as we'll talk a little bit later on here this afternoon, that SOAP-based web services are completely defunct. In fact, there are reasons why one might still want to use SOAP-based web services. But an alternative exists, and an alternative is what we're going to look at, one that helps address this, uh, what usually most people find to be kind of a screaming uh, problem of trying to get up and running and learning all about the SOAP tends to uh, really exhaust a lot of people, and for that matter, sometimes even exhausts some of the machines in trying to handle that bloat. Okay, so what is our SOAP alternative? What is one of our SOAP alternatives? And what is the topic of our conversation today? RESTful Web Services. RESTful Web Services, 
are still a language and platform independent uh, technology. In other words, still addressing that machine to machine um, communication in an interoperable fashion. So it allows our, our .NET applications to talk to our Java applications and vice versa. Uh, just about anything can communicate uh, via RESTful web service um, paradigm as long as they are able to essentially operate in the web paradigm. And that's why most people find RESTful web services a bit simpler, a bit easier to use because it's based on the worldwide web paradigm. Uh, and in fact, a lot of people claim that this technology is putting the web back into web services. When you hear the term web services, um, Yep, we may use and often use the web paradigm to help exchange those uh, SOAP messages, or I should say we use the HTTP protocol as a means to facilitate a SOAP-based exchange. But when you really take a look at how web services operate as a developer, we're not always really cognizant or really see that web back in web services. And so hopefully RESTful web services, as we'll see today, helps bring that part back into our development world. We'll also find that RESTful web services can be much more concise. They can actually be as concise as you would like them to be. In fact, as far as data formats are concerned, you can still use something like XML, but you don't have to. You can use uh, other technologies, XHTML, JSON, something we'll talk a little bit about here today as well. In fact, I've even seen the use of things like comma-separated values to exchange data in a RESTful way. So really, the, the both the choice and the format of data is in many cases, dependent on what the client desires. That's another great example of how RESTful web services are offering an alternative that is pleasing to many people. It's really the clients that choose their format, and that format can be pretty small and concise where needed. And lastly, we say that the RESTful web services allow for cacheable results. That kind of goes with the World Wide Web paradigm. If you get on the browser of choice, and go out to uh, Google and you search for something and you find a particular page or document that you like, you can cache that page inside of your browser or as a favorite, if you will, a link. Same kind of idea applies in the RESTful world where we can cache those results, something that from a SOAP uh, mechanism, that gets to be a bit tougher for us to do. And certainly um, anything is possible, but caching really wasn't something that was thought of as far as the SOAP paradigm was concerned. So when we talk about uh, RESTful web services, I'm often asked a question about, well, with regard to SOAP-based web services, Jim, those are all based in uh, SOA, and everybody, of course, is going to the SOA world, and by SOA we mean the service-oriented architecture. So, yes, yeah, certainly SOAP-based web services are all about service-oriented architecture day. When we talk about service-oriented architectures, the, the whole SOAP API and paradigm is built around a whole stack called the WS Splat or WS Star set of specifications that dictate how those uh, web services communicate that SOAP-based XML messages back and forth to one another. So this is an architecture loaded with standards, and with standards uh, come a lot of good things. The ability essentially for interoperability without too much concern about needing to worry about the platforms both our client and our server operates on, uh, knowing that things aren't going to change uh, all that much going forward in the future. So SOA and SOAP-based web services are wonderful but from that perspective. When we talk about RESTful web services, are they SOA? Well, that's a tough question to answer directly. It really depends a little bit on your perspective. A lot of people think about RESTful web services not so much in a SOA way, but some of the new terms that are now cropping up around RESTful web services are WOA or ROA, if you will, RESTful-oriented architectures or web-oriented architectures. And this is more about a style as we'll learn. There really aren't standards beyond those that are built around HTTP and the World Wide Web already. It's more about a style applied to how we uh, provide that interoperable communication. In fact, uh, several people have started to uh, look at the RESTful web services, or what are known as web-oriented architectures, as being a, a combination of SOA plus REST plus the World Wide Web, which gives you a little bit of an insight into that there's a hard time kind of pressing RESTful web services into a certain pegged area. In fact, again, webs, when we talk about RESTful web services and using the web, we are talking about the facilitation of machine-to-machine -machine communication. But one way to think about RESTful web services is that really RESTful web services is about the communication of data to machines almost as if a web, it's a website. So we will hear a lot of people talk about how 
RESTful web services are essentially websites for machines versus those types of websites that we humans go to. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.